Welcome everyone to this webinar, CLSA webinar today. I'm Jennifer Boyko and I'm the Senior Manager of Scientific Operations with the Canadian Longitudinal Study on Aging or CLSA for short. Thank you so much for joining the webinar today, which is entitled Associations Between Differential Aging and Lifestyle, Environment, Current and Future Health Conditions. Uh, first, uh, before we begin, I'd like to acknowledge that the CLSA National Coordinating Center and McMaster University are both located on the traditional territories of the Mississauga and Haudenosaunee nations and within the lands protected by the Dish with One Spoon Wampum Agreement. The University of Alberta, where today's presenter is based, is situated on Treaty 6 territory, which is a traditional uh, gathering place for diverse Indigenous people, including the Cree, Blackfoot, Métis, Nakota, Sioux, Iroquois, Dene, uh, Ojibwe, Solto, Anishinaabe, and Inuit. As attendees of this webinar today, I do encourage you to continue learning and following the webinar um, to acknowledge the original inhabitants of the lands where we currently have the privilege to research, live, work, wherever that may be for you. Now I'd like to review a few housekeeping points. Uh, everyone but the presenter today will be muted throughout the webinar. If you do need to change or test your audio at any point, you can click on audio settings, which is in the bottom of the Zoom window. At the end of today's uh, webinar, there will be a question and answer session. If you have a question for the presenter at any time during the webinar, you can post it in the Q&A box, which is located in the bottom toolbar. The questions will be addressed at the very end of the webinar. Um, and these questions will be visible to all attendees. If you have any technical trouble concerning the webinar, um, please use the chat box to communicate with the webinar team. Um, and finally, a feedback survey will be launched at the end of the webinar. And we uh, invite you to complete it after the Zoom session today. Um, it does provide us with important feedback that we can use to plan and improve on future webinars. Now to the webinar itself, uh, entitled, like I said, Associations Between Differential Aging and Lifestyle, uh, Environment, Current and Future Conditions, uh, Health Conditions, and the webinar is presented by Dr. Bo Tsao. Uh, Dr. Tsao is an Associate Professor in the Department of Psychiatry and is also a Canada Research Chair in Computational Psychiatry at the University of Alberta. He is Co-Director of the Computational Psychiatry Group and he's an expert in using machine learning and big data to predict the diagnosis and treatment outcomes of psychiatric disorders. He has published several papers in top psychiatry journals. His research interests include aging, portable brain imaging, and non-invasive neuromodulation. Uh, he plays an essential role in the team of computational and digital psychiatry at the University of Alberta. And uh, now with no further ado, I do pass it on to you, Dr. Sal. Thank you, Jennifer, <clears throat> for the very kind introduction. Uh, let's, let me load. Oh, oh, sorry. I need to share the screen again, I believe. Uh, just one second. Okay, can you see my screen? Yep, looks good. Okay, great. Yep, thank you, Jennifer, for the introduction, and thank you, Laura, for the help um, to for this talk. And I would like to thank uh, CISA again for the for the invitation, but also for providing this uh, top notch data. So, um, you know, I have the fortune to you know scan through several um, aging data across the world. And uh, personally, I think CISA is one of the top-notch uh, data out there. So, you know, thank you for, you know, for all the work collecting the data and organizing the data and sharing it with the researchers. So today I'm going to talk about association between differential aging and lifestyle, environment, current and future health conditions. So um, I'm actually in psychiatry, but uh, I have a long-term uh, interest in aging. I will talk about it uh, very soon. Uh, but before I enter to my talk, uh, just some disclosure and this uh, disclaimers. Um, 
there's no conflict of interest um, to disclose. Um, I'm graduate. Uh, I'm grateful to be situated on the Treaty Six territory. Um, this talk just includes my personal opinions. I cannot represent uh, the the university or any organization, and I'm I'm not an expert in all the fields I I talk about. So I I major in uh, uh, neuroscience in my education, and uh, and then I move on to uh, psychiatry. So in my bachelor and masters, I used to I was used to train uh, in uh, psychology and uh, mathematics. So you know I I I don't consider myself as an expert uh, of uh, in aging. So I'm really grateful that I have this opportunity to share uh, my research uh, in this field, and uh, you know and also to learn from uh, other aging experts, and also for this talk. Uh, I never consider uh, my talk as a, just a, like one direction or one way talk. So I always always consider this uh, as a you know um, a opportunity for me to learn from the audience as well. So yeah, if you have any um, questions, please feel free to share it in the chat, and uh, you know we will have a chance to answer answer them uh, at the end of the talk. And also, um, you know, I will try to actually um, do some light touches of the topic, uh, you know, that uh, I talk about. And without going too too you know too much detail there, and uh, so that you can you know check check the papers or check other resources if you want to, and uh, yeah, and also the figures that may belong to the original owners. Uh, usually, I will indicate them uh, at the bottom right of the slides. And uh, one one reminder as well, I think it's important for uh, for the public, um, and also for some peer researchers as well that. But the result I, I, I show may, may not be necessarily uh, causal. So which means that if you see some life factors is associated with something, it doesn't mean that uh, you know change that left lifestyle will you know like a uh, you know benefit your aging or you know uh, put you on the risk of something. So just a reminder of that. And usually I want to keep my talk uh, relatively you know, shorter. I, I, I don't think, uh, you know, human attention span can just uh, stay like super focused uh, over like 15 minutes. So I will try to just, uh, you know, um, complete within, you know, 30 or 40 minutes. So my my motivations about aging, you know, you know, like why I'm here, you know, I'm from psychiatry, I research in mental health. So um, one personal motivation for me is that I think everyone is aging, you know, you know, after after 25 years old, right? So we enter into another um, period of our lifespan. And I think everyone is aging and we are, we are you know, I don't have a slide showing, um, you know, the, the burden for aging as I believe, you know, like for all the previous talks in CISA uh, seminars, uh, you guys are already like familiar with uh, this. So I think, but uh, just one summary that we are entering into an age of aging and uh, we will have a much larger aging populations and uh, you know and we are all aging at the same time and another personal motivation for me is uh you know there are a lot of uh, mystics you know out there you know oh you should eat this you should do this you know for your life and uh and even even something that we know that you know well known that uh, oh you know this might be beneficial for you for example if you do some sports and if you sleep well it's probably good for your age, uh, aging, right? Um, but but that's actually not the end of the the story, you know. If if you tell me, okay, you know, you should do some sports, but but how much? What kind of sports? Uh, you know, and if you tell me to sleep well, and but how do I measure sleep, right? So I'm actually wearing smart devices every day to just to check my sleep. I try to see whether I, I can have some insights about that. And if you tell me, okay, you know, like uh, if, uh, you know, drinking something, uh, you know, every day is actually increase your chance to get some, you know, you know, some health condition, including cancer, I may actually, you know, double check and consider maybe I should not drinking that thing every day, right? So those those are all the things that for my personal motivation. Um, and the, the second motivation is, uh, I will talk more about it when I talk about brain aging. Uh, or brain age index that we want to compress the complex aging process into some simple indicators and uh, of course you know through this process we will lose some information there 
And uh, it, it may not necessarily actually be less confusing compared to you know a more um, thorough metrics uh, profile. But uh, but uh, by having a you know an aging index, it may help us to first of all you know summarize all the complex patterns into some simple indicator, but it also make it comparable across individuals. So I think that is also very important. And uh, I want to understand this, what we mean by successful aging. So in my CISA proposal, I want to investigate a successful aging, but uh, that was actually five years ago. And these days, I think uh, we are all aware, you know, like this term might not be ideal actually. You know, what do, what do we mean by successful, successful aging? You know, like then how do you define unsuccessful aging and how do you define like not so successful aging? So, um, you know, we probably need to change the term also, you know, to not make it the like, um, you know, biased towards certain population. And uh, we all understand, you know, aging or successful su successful aging might be actually having both objective and subjective component. Um, yeah, we can talk more about it later as well, you know, if people are interested. But, uh, you know, I think WHO start to use, uh, you know, other things like, uh, you know, active aging or, you know, other more neutral terms these days rather than, you know, healthy or successful aging. Um, another motivation is uh, I really want to integrate mental and physical health and well-being, you know, not only just like uh, detect disease, uh, you know, when we have it. So, you know, can we improve our well-being, you know, or prevent something or, you know, enhance something during aging? And uh, and I think I'm well aware of, uh, of uh, you know, there's, there's no segmentation between mental and phys physical health if you consider that from a patient perspective. So I want to integrate them. I want to consider them over the lifespan. So that's my motivation, you know, why I'm doing some research, some studies on aging. So my personal research, my primary focus is about precision mental health across lifespan. And you can imagine that, you know, aging, as, uh, you know, it's, it's actually a very important part of that. Um, I, but to do that, you know, to do the precision mental health, I, I, need, I need a lot of data and I need to integrate um, you know, different domains. And I also need to uh, uh, need help from computational tools like AI and machine learning. So if people are interested, I can talk more about AI and, uh, and machine learning as well, and as well as mental health later. But my, my research, I work with data, I work with uh, machine learning a lot. So what machine learning is one specific domain in AI. So it all started with uh, brain age. So, you know, before we even start to talk about like associations of uh, differential aging of uh, all the other factors. So what is differential aging? You know, how, how do we even define that? So there, there was actually a historical reason for my uh, personal research uh, life. So back in 2013 or 14, so that, that's actually already more than 10 years ago. So we want to, you know, one thing in, in, in neuroscience or also in psychiatry is that we know, you know, like mental disorders are most, uh, you know, almost just the brain disorders. And we also know the brain is so adaptive and it's actually changed across the lifespan. So then the question arises, you know, like uh, if you want to compare two groups, you know, for example, one group of patients with a bipolar disorder and the other group of, uh, you know, relatively like what we call controls or healthy controls, uh, you know, if they are at a different age, you know, slightly different age, and we know the brain changes with age, how do we account for that uh, difference? So that was actually the motivation. And then we enter into the field, okay, you know, like if you want to summarize the brain changes over age or over lifespan, the challenge we face here is that, you know, the brain is so complicated and, uh, you know, each brain region, even if we define the brain region, like in a very simple, you know, simplified way like this, you know, like we, you know, parcelate the brain into, you know, maybe uh, roughly 70 regions here or 100, re 100 regions here. And then if you check each region, even just the, their volume, you know, we're not even talking about other more complicated metrics here, even just the volume or cortical thickness, you actually see you know, different regions actually, they may increase, they may uh, decrease over the age. 
and uh, and then different individuals will have for different regions they will have like different changes then how do we even compare you know across the individuals that was actually the main challenge here and so you know the goal was that to say okay you know longitudinally after you know after several years you know for example between between two visits so is your brain developing or aging you know normally right is it like under development? Is it under developing or is it aging faster? So that's actually something we want to learn back then. And then we actually try to say, okay, maybe it's uh, it's good to use just the machine learning to summarize all the complicated or complex patterns and try to say, okay, you know, can we summarize the 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 brain maturation and aging into just one index? And to do that, we use what we usually do, like the concept of brain age is to say, okay, you know, here are the, all the measurements uh, of the brain. And then let's use all the measurements to try to predict the, the chronological age for that person. So once you can do that, because you are using the brain to predict uh, the, the chronological age, so we can call this uh, indicator as brain age. So we can talk more about the details and concept of, about this. But uh, this, this concept actually got popular over the past uh, 10 to 15 years. And it it's, it's definitely have, have some convenience there. And yeah, it, it also comes with some problems. So back then, you know, um, the brain age concept just emerged and we we say, okay, you know, we, we talk about brain age, but do we even know, you know, this brain age is, is actually valuable across longitudinal data? You know, for example, it's it's very simple scientific question, right? So if you say brain age works, if if one subject come came like a three years later compared to the baseline, so we should predict his or her brain to to get three years older. So that was like, that was actually a fairly simple question, but I, you know it it didn't get answer back then. So I did this study and I, I developed this uh, uh, brain age or brain maturation index. Actually, this was actually in the adolescence, but the concept was the same, um, you know, over the lifespan. So we we try to predict the, the individual uh, brain age. And then we say, okay, you know, we have the longitudinal data. And if we say, okay, you know, the, you know, between the visit one and the visit two, visit one is the baseline, visit two is the follow-up. If there was a, a you know three eight a three years gap for this individual, uh, we should predict uh, his or her brain to be three years older. If the gap was uh, you know five years, we should predict a, uh, the brain get uh, you know five years older. So that was actually the motivation, and it turned it turned out that uh, we could do that. And uh, you know on on the right panel you can see uh, you know this is actually individual trajectory. And uh, you know the x-axis is the average chronological age increase, and the, the y-axis is the, the average uh, brain maturation index change. Um, you know you can see that for most individuals it's actually quite accurate, but you can also see that uh, there are there are some people, a few folks, right? So we have actually um, you know I think over one hundred or two hundred people here, but uh, you know, there are a few people that, uh, you know, all over the two visits, right? So you, you actually see that uh, although the, the chronological age increased, increased uh, the, the brain age was predicted uh, to be to, to decrease. So um, that was actually interesting. It might be just the error of the model, actually. So, and through this model, we actually can capture also, you know, what are the regions that is predictive for brain age? So this is actually slightly different compared to just a directly do um, a correlation between you know each region with age. So this is actually these regions, you know, when you find them in a machine learning model to say, okay, they are predictive for individual level brain age. So it means usually that usually most of the time, usually they are significant um, you know associated with age already, but they are also in addition they are also predictive for individual. Brain age, so not you know beyond just the group level. I can talk more about it if people are interested. So we find some regions, you know, like a lot of regions that are reliably decreasing, you know, especially the cortical regions, they're reliably decreasing with age even during you know the like the first uh, eighteen years of the of the life. 
And there are some regions that are increasing as well. And uh, for, for, for those of you who want to have some fun to read, and uh, you know, we even actually expand this brain age concept into monkeys. So this actual paper that uh, uh, we recently got affected is still, it, it's, uh, it's already online, but it's, uh, it's under the, uh, the proofing uh, session, um, period. So we actually use a similar concept and uh, we, we were fortunate to have the collaboration with, uh, with, uh, with the Harvard group. And uh, we uh, those those monkeys was act were actually scanned uh, across two sites, and we even validate the brain age across these two sets. And uh, as you can see, you know, like over the lifespan of the monkeys, uh, we actually can also predict their their brain age as well. So this paper is going to be published in Neurobiology of Age. So now let's uh, move on to to the research about uh, the association uh, studies of all differential aging. So it's actually a similar concept with the brain age, but uh, in this paper specifically, uh, instead of using the brain scans, which actually, you know, it's very expensive, uh, you know, like there's no way that we scan a, the brains using MRI or magnetic resonance imaging uh, for the whole population. So in this study, we use the CISA data and uh, use the comprehensive uh, uh, cohort, which actually include, includes about 30,000 people. And uh, most of them actually have this uh, uh, laboratory uh, blood uh, check or blood test. So those, those markers, those 31 markers, uh, for those of you who are interested, you can, you can uh, get to the paper. This paper was actually published in uh, uh, gerontology, and I think it's open access. Um, so we use the 31 blood markers and try to say, okay, you know, we know some of the markers, they might change over age, but can we, you know, reverse the problem? Can we use this uh, 31 blood markers, which are usually routinely tested, you know, in, in blood test or lo lo laboratory, laboratory test um, to predict age? So, and the answer is that yes, we can, but uh, the model is actually not, you know, not perfect for sure. But once we build this, the uh, bring uh, sorry. Once we build this aging uh, index or, or or blood age or biological age based on these uh, blood markers, we can then try to investigate. Okay, you know whether someone they have a biological age. So for this biological age, I'm actually only referring to the to the aging index or predicted age that we developed based on the thirty one blood markers or we can short, make it short for like bio age. So once you have the bio age for everyone, you know, for the almost 30,000 people that we have here. So what we can ask is, uh, you know, who actually have, who actually has a brain a bio age larger than his or her own chronological age. So for example, you know, if I'm at my 60, you know, but uh, my bio age is uh, 70, so that's actually 10 years larger than my chronological age. So I would like to know, you know, what's going on there, right? So again, this is actually almost like a snapshot, you know, or on the cross-sectional study. So we cannot directly indicate the speed of aging here. But, uh, you know, like if some people show, you know, a, a very high uh, bio age gap here, what we mean by bio age gap is the, you know, the increased predicted bio age compared to the chronological age. So then we want to know whether there's something associated with that. And of course there are people, you know, they may have actually a much lower bio age compared to the chronological age, which in which case you will have a negative bio age gap. And then we will also want to want to know, right? But in this paper, we focus on the, the most of the part are actually the risky part, but we will see some protective factors here. So, um, you know, after we develop this uh, bio age gap, then we can actually start to do the association study. Again, it is not causal here. You know, everything is uh, just, uh, you know, based on the cross-sectional study. And uh, even if this is a, a, a longitudinal study, if we're not manipulating any of the uh, variables here, especially the life factor and dietary factors, um, you know, we cannot uh, conclude this, these are causal. So just, uh, you know, please interpret this result with caution. Um, so we actually find something, <laughs> excuse me. 
And you know, like for for example, you know, it's a, it's a bit busy here, but I just want to do a very quick summary. You know, um, there are something if people eat uh, every day, like things like red meat or sausage. It seems that it, those uh, dietary uh, style they they are associated with uh, increased uh, uh, bio age. You know, just based on your blood blood markers. And if you eat actually uh, uh, linguine, uh, fruits and the vegetables every day, it seems that uh, you know the bio age actually uh, is lower. You know, I I wouldn't even say that it's decreased because you eat this. So we don't know for sure. But uh, it's definitely a social, you know, those, those, you know, those, those uh, dietary habits, uh, like uh, eating, you know, fruit and vegetables every day, they they are associated with uh, a, a lower bio age, or we can say that a negative bio age gap. And uh, we also confirm that uh, you know, uh, smoking um, is actually associated with uh, a positive age gap, and uh, even passive smoking actually associated with a uh, uh, a uh, positive age gap, and uh, and also play tennis is actually associated with uh, with a, a negative age gap. But uh, <laughs> excuse me again, you you have to you know interpret this with caution. You know, like uh, it might be just uh, th for those people who are able to play tennis like uh, as an intensive uh, sports. You know, they might already having some other you know lifestyle or even genetic or even environmental. Uh, factors that help them to age slightly better, and uh, and then you know they they also plan play tennis, have the tendency to play tennis. So you know we're not so sure here, but uh, but this is actually what the data show. And also uh, you know if people are in a wheelchair, it's actually also associated with um, a positive uh, age gap. This actually indicates some needs there, right? So if someone um, uh, you know, having a higher frailty index or having um, a restrictions for mobility, mobility. You know, should we introduce more, um, you know, physical activity or other um, help to the, for them? You know, during the aging. So, and we also investigated. Uh, you know, this actually you, you can consider this study as uh, uh, still as a ex exploratory study that. Uh, um, you know, we we developed this aging index or bio age, but we're not sure what exactly it means, right? So we want to see, okay, what is associated with? Apparently, it's not specific enough to certain conditions, right? So, uh, but we want to see, you know, whether it's useful and whether it's uh, predictive for something. So here, we did some investigation about the, the baseline uh, 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 health conditions. And we can find, you know, if you have some any of the major uh, chronic conditions, and the bell age will be higher. So, and then we then we investigate like a different the heart disease and then cancer and other conditions, and you can you can see that most of the health major health conditions. Uh, so I I wouldn't say most, but for the health conditions I listed here, they are all associated with a positive age age gap, which means that um, this population having a, a um, higher bio age compared to their peers at the same age. Okay, and uh, what is more interesting to me is uh, you know whether this uh, bio age gap is actually predictive for something. So we check actually uh, the future health conditions, which actually we, because we have the follow up study in the CIC study, right? So we know in the follow up who actually developed um, you know certain uh, condition here. So we only listed uh, you know um, several conditions here. Because not everything were significant, um, but what we try to do was that <laughs> whether the baseline bell age gap was associated with any of the future health conditions. So uh, some, you know, I, I don't want to go through the table. You know, I, you, you don't have to either. But um, I just want to name some of the very significant ones here. One of them is actually Parkinson disease. So at baseline, so if, if someone develops a Parkinson disease, you know, several years later. So at the baseline, their barrel age was already like two years older uh, than their peers. And we also have Alzheimer disease. We also have kidney disease. Um, yeah, I mean, some of them are not surprising, like kidney disease. Uh, usually it's, uh, you know, like it's, it's, it's got reflected. And also diabetes, right? So it's got reflected to some extent 
you know, in, 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 your, in your blood age. What, that's actually also tell us, right? So maybe, you know, if we monitor um, those um, um, blood markers close enough, we may actually be able to, do, to detect certain of this disease uh, earlier, right? Um, in a holistic way, right? Not only, for example, diabetes, it, certainly you will monitor, you know, um, your blood glucose and, uh, you know, hemoglobins. Um, but, uh, you know, if you consider everything else, right? So it, it may be helpful actually to, to try to uh, capture this disease early. But again, this is not specific to any of the disease, but uh, this definitely give us some direction, you know, okay, the baseline um, bio age, even just the, from very simple blood test, it's actually, you know, to some extent predictive for future health conditions. So, you know, as we are from psychiatry, we're also interested in, you know, like, sorry um, to go back uh, just one time, you know, like uh, uh, among these conditions, you actually see that, uh, you know, we actually have mood disorders and we have anxiety, which is actually was not significant. But uh, we are actually curious to know whether we can predict some of the mental disorders as well, you know, using all the survey data that we have, not only just the blood markers. So that's actually what we did. We also used the comprehensive uh, uh, baseline data and we try to predict the depression onset at follow up. So basically these people at the follow up, they developed depression. So, you know, the conditions were like, uh, you know, they, they self-reported that they were diagnosed as a clinical depression or they have some positive depression symptoms based on a, a scale called CSD-10 here. So these are actually a very broad term to detect depression onset. But I want to mention that these people, they didn't have any of these sim depression symptoms beyond the threshold, or they didn't report any clinical depression at baseline. So this is what, what we call depression onset or newly developed depression at follow-up. We are using the baseline data and uh, you know the survey data uh, from CISA to try to predict who will develop depression at follow-up. And we use different uh, um, uh, machine learning models. And I, I'll skip this uh, really fast. Um, and then we find, okay, you know, sorry, maybe I need to reverse this a little bit. So, you know, if we use the, the, the depression symptoms like the CSD10 score or the K10 score, it's not surprising, you know, even at the baseline, even they are not beyond their threshold to be defined as depression at that time. So if they have a higher score, you know, in certain, um, in the total and also the sub uh, items of the of this uh, uh, scales, you know, they might uh, develop depression. You know, uh, we can actually, we can predict this, you know, to some extent. Um, but what is more interesting to me is actually even for the non-clinical uh, relevant, like the K K10 or clin uh, CSD10 score, even by just using personality and the other, uh, you know, even like nutrition and other things here, and even like the perceived health and perceived mental health, we can still, you know, predict the depression onset. So that was actually very interesting to me. So, you know, like things like treat emotion um, stability, life satisfaction, perceived health and mental health, nutrition risk factors, they, they, they are all contributing, you know, to predict depression onset as well. So those are the, the applications, you know, like, um, again, I really appreciate the, the, the rich data from CISA to make this such a studies uh, possible. So these are the founders uh, for my research. And uh, I think, uh, yeah, this is actually my goal that uh, I want to uh, end this, uh, you know, within 40 minutes, then we can actually have a, a discussion. And I can even go into more details and if people are interested about more about the mental health part or the AI and the machine learning part or about other aspects of uh, aging that we do. Thank you, everyone. So I'm taking questions now. Well, thank you so much, Dr. Cao. Um, excellent presentation, lots to think about. Um, like you said, we can now take some time for questions. Um, just a reminder that we will keep the muting on though. So um, you'll need to post your uh, questions into the Q&A box that are at the bottom. And I know we already had one earlier um, about an earlier point you made. And that is, um, uh, the question is, I think you said that apparent benefits of ten tennis on brain bio age is not controlled for compounding. Is that correct? Yeah, that's a good question. You know, um, it's actually more complicated than that. So when we, um, we actually, whenever we do association study like this, you know, between the bio age and, uh, and certain factors like a certain sports type, 
we actually try to control some of the other things like age, sex, education, you know, um, social economic status. But uh, we didn't control for every other things, you know, um, in in the data. Um, yeah, that to some extent that is correct. But uh, we we did control for some some very apparent, uh, you know, uh, demographic uh, and the social economic factors there. Um, but the thing is that uh, you know uh, when we actually um, uh, develop other um, aging index, a lot of times you know the the bio age type we show here is actually a very very special case here you know because we only use the blood marker, but uh, for other studies uh, you know when we use the survey data, we actually consider you know a lot of things there, and uh, it's very hard to say that. Uh, uh, you know, um, it's uh, it's not it's controlled or it's not controlled. But when we do the association study, we try to control the apparent stuff. And uh, if someone stand out, you know, as the statistical significance, we report that. But uh, but even that, you know, it doesn't mean that 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 single factor it just like uh, can play its role alone, right? So that's uh, something we need to remember. Okay, great. Uh, so we now have all ask both questions from Christian. Um, the first one being, is there any correlation between brain age and bio age? And then the second part is, how did you control for preclinical um, AD when you established brain age? Yeah, good questions. Um, you know, I, I think I couldn't recall like a, any of the recent uh, studies uh, on the correlation between brain age and the bio age. So that's actually some definitely something that uh, you know we can investigate. I, but I you know I would assume that uh, some people from UK or using the UK Bell Bank data might be might have done that already. Um, my guess would be yes, there will definitely be some you know a positive association there um, because uh, the brain is actually not standing alone. And uh, you know whenever you have certain conditions, uh, you know chronic conditions. Usually, especially you know those conditions affecting the blood flow to your brain, and uh, you know usually that will actually impact uh, the brain age as well, right? So you can imagine you know the bio age change, especially based on the blood markers, like uh, what I showed here. Uh, you know uh, some of the factors is actually relevant to, you know, the immune system is relevant to the overall condition. You know about the glucose and other stuff. And those things, um, they will definitely associate with the brain age as well. So my guess is, uh, yes, it sh there should be a positive uh, correlation uh, between the brain age and the bio age. Um, but how strong? You know, like, again, we, we we can have this guess, and we all know it. It probably makes sense. But uh, but specifically, you know, how they are correlated, but and also what kind of brain age and what kind of bio age, uh, right? So um, you know, we I only show like the, the blood marker, but what what about something else? So um, yeah, uh, that that's my answer. And uh, as for the answer for the preclinical AD, I think uh, um, I, I actually I couldn't recall for this specific study whether we excluded AD. So I remember that uh, we probably didn't, but uh, but I also remember um, the proportion of AD was actually quite low. And um, I actually couldn't recall any, uh, you know, mild cognitive impairment uh, indicators that are actually large in uh, having a large sem uh, enough sample for us to exclude or to 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 you know to consider specifically. So yeah, the short answer is uh, uh, no, we didn't exclude anyone. We tried to use everyone there, but uh, you know the the the. the the dilemma is that if you consider, okay, you know, you want to exclude the preclinical AD, but then what about, uh, you know, Parkinson's disease? What about other conditions? And uh, as we age, you know, having non-chronic uh, conditions, it's actually the, the, the chance is actually getting lower and lower as we age. So, you know, and also that proportion also changes with age as, as, as well, you know. So to do that exclusion for a specific condition, it's um it's it's actually more it's more challenging uh, than people's uh, thought. I can imagine. Um, okay, we're starting to get lots of questions in now. So the next one is from Shimin. Uh, when training a model to predict aging, I understand the regression to mean problem arises. Um, that is, older adults are overestimated and younger um, patients are underestimated. 
were you able to prep for this? Oh, um, actually, uh, when training, actually, you know, like, uh, th this is actually a very interesting and also technical questions. And uh, actually, my um, my 2015 paper, you know, already addressed this to some extent, um, but not fully. So this a this aging index, you know, it's actually on the opposite, um, you know, from um, what. Uh, what what this question was uh, was asking actually, you know, in fact, when you have noises in your regression, usually we have a we have an effect called um, a set, uh, a dilution or attenuation of the regression. So that means that the you the estimated bio age or predicted age is actually lower at at uh, at uh, you know the older people and the higher. Uh, at, in the younger people, so it's actually opposite to what the 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 this uh um the the, the question indicated. So, but we still have to correct that. You know, like we can actually regress again with the bell age gap with the age, and we have other means to to do the correction as well. So, but uh, yeah, that 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 is something that we need to consider. You know, if your bell age gap is actually changing with age, you know, in a systematic way, so that means that you actually introduce a systematic bias. So we have to consider that as well. But in linear models, you know, when you do the statistical analysis, you actually can just include age in your analysis and just to try to consider that as a, you know, covariance. Um, and continuing on the theme with analysis, um, we have a question about what the PNOVA is. And I was actually wondering about that myself. I think that was in one of your tables. And then what specific machine learning method did you use? Mixed effects regression, um, uh, is of course very helpful in modeling longitudinal data. Okay, <laughs> let me answer the machine learning pro uh, uh, first. And uh, actually, I'm, I'm not sure whether it's a P no P is it P ANOVA that we were asking. Uh, it was in I think the, one of the tables. I, I saw yeah. maybe it was a so, typo. I don't know. May, uh, maybe actually it's just like that. regular ANOVAs, but uh, we we did yeah. have some like a partial uh, correlation or partial analysis. But but I remember that was actually in the supplementary. So the main analysis was just like a regular uh, ANOVAs, but we did try to control something like I mentioned before. And back to the question about machine learning. Um, so we usually deploy several algorithms together and let the data to choose which one you know, is the best. Um, but usually, um, usually the linear model should work uh, good enough but uh, but you know you, usually that's actually what I work with you know like we start with the linear uh, model like just like regression model, but uh, that regression I think I, I saw some questions there asking about regression, but the in machine learning you know we uh, we care very much about the how the model can be generalized, you know so the regular regression that uh, you see in statistics uh, is actually not working because it's actually overfitting almost all the time. So we actually use what we call the regularized uh, regression. You know, it's actually controlling all the coefficients and uh, to make sure the model can be generalized to new data. And uh, so uh, famous uh, um, uh, regularized uh, regression, you know, you can find like Lasso, you can find Elastic Net, you can find Ridge regression. Those are actually typical uh, regularized machine learning uh, regression uh, algorithm we use. But in the BioH paper, that using the blood markers, what we found was that, you know, the the linear model was actually not as good as uh, some other models that we used. We actually use a, a gradient boosting model, like which actually was tray based uh, model. So that's actually one thing that is uh, getting uh, popular as well uh, these days. That uh, you know use uh, some you know what we call the weak learners and uh, assemble them together to try to make the overall prediction. And these days, uh, you know, before the the, the the ensemble model, like the you know, boosting gradient boosting and uh, and uh, random forest, um, we also have like a some people may heard the uh, support vector machines, and that that was also quite popular, especially in brain imaging. And these days, we also have uh, artificial neural networks, especially deep learning. So um, yeah, I don't want to go to, into details uh, of the algorithms uh, for now, but um, yeah, those are the things that we usually consider. Um, there are like a uh, lot of uh, algorithms that uh, you know we can try, but we usually try the 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 ones that that, that is uh, reliable and also easy to interpret. Um, and I think you 
answer the next question um, about uh, machine learning and how did you calculate predicted biological age? I don't know if there's anything else you wanted to. Yeah. So I think I just want to remind um, the concept of the, the of the bio age or brain age, right? Altogether. So you can just imagine it's almost like just a regression like um, a model, right? So basically you try to predict the chronological age based on your, for example, the, the, the blood data. And, uh, but once you have this, you know, because your domain was actually from the blood data. So you actually have um, an estimation of all the people, you know, compared to their peers, uh, you know, like a, you have a norm, you know, of, of the population, you know, how people um, age with respect to using their blood. So then you can use this, uh, 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 you know, as a norm and uh, compare different individuals. So because each individual, you actually develop such a, a, a index. So this is actually something, in my opinion, it's more useful, you know, because uh, for, this is actually the same um, concept when you try to personalize uh, diagnosis or treatment outcome predictions as well when you use machine learning. Because uh, I, you know, if you, if you try to detect a, a, a group pattern, uh, it's a very good as a first step, but it's actually, for me, it's not useful uh, until I see whether this model can be used as on a new uh, individual patient or subject. And uh, sort of changing gears from statistics to uh, uh, practice, um, any key messages for dietitians who cancel people in food and nutrition? based on your <laughs> findings. And understanding yeah. this would be your uh, uh, opinion at this point. Yeah, again, yeah. First of all, personal opinion, I'm not an expert in this field. And also, um, you know, again, all the results I've shown are not causal, right? So um, we do see some associations. Um, you know, I'll be cautious about giving, uh, you know, um, suggestions just based on this data. But personally, you know, like uh, when I see the data myself, again, this is my, not my, any, you know, medical suggestions, right? But when I see the data myself, the first thing I thought, you know, about the dietary was that, okay, I probably don't want to eat uh, red meat or sausage every day. Now, I'm not saying that I'm avoiding them altogether, but uh, it seems that uh, if you want to like reduce your bio age to some extent, it's probably better not to uh, keep eating them every day, right? So I'm not saying that they're, they're bad, right? But uh, that's actually what the data tell me. That's just my personal opinion. And what about, have you considered doing um, uh, more causal associations? Um, the question from Shimin is, are you, so, yeah. have you been able to consider performing Mendelian randomization? Good question. Actually, um, I, we, I think one of the projects, we tried something like that. Uh, again, you know, even for the for people who are not familiar with this term, uh, so Mendelian uh, randomization is actually a way to estimate um, a causal relationship in ob observational data because we cannot ma manipulate the whole population to say, okay, you cannot eat this, you can, you, you know, you, you have to do this. Um, the short answer is that we we haven't in a, in a systematic way. And also remember that is actually a, a way to estimate the causal relationship. It, there's, you know, it's not definite, definitive. You know, you can say that okay, that that is a causal. The only way is actually you you manipulate something to say you 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 increase or decrease of this uh, lifestyle, or you change this, and then you see some results. That might be causal. So um, yeah, other than that, I I don't think that we have a way to 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 very confident to say this is causal. Um, and Jack had a question similar, I think, to the question um, related to dietitian. Um, how do you envision integrating this biological age gap assessment into routine clinical practice? Yeah, good question. Um, <laughs> we are far away from that, to be short. And uh, again, you know, by compressing such com complicated patterns into just one indicator, um, you can guarantee that it's not directly useful, right, for, for, for a specific condition. But uh, we are still exploring, you know, like uh, how we can use this as an indicator for generally how people age. And then, you know, maybe by combining other stuff, you know, other information, we can actually guide people about, uh, you know, some clinical or even well-being decisions. But uh, we are not there yet. We are far from, far away from that. Well, at least you're in the, in the process. Um, I think the next two questions are, are somewhat related. Um, the first one being, do you think sex and gender would significantly change the findings? And then 
the next question is um, looking at racial and, and ethnic differences. Mm. So any of those um, factors, how, the, how that would perhaps influence the findings that you had? Yeah, all good questions. Um, the second gender, um, you know, I actually, I, I'm actually very interested in this uh, topic actually, <laughs> but the problem is that um, there are, I don't think we have enough sample size, uh, you know, like uh, I, I remember we in CRC data that we do have a, a question asking about uh, the the, uh, the sexual orientation. It's not actually even just the, the, the gender identity. It's just like asking whether, you know, um, uh, the subject is, uh, you know, homosexual or he uh, heterosexual, those kind of questions. I don't remember if we have like, I mean, I, I, at least for the baseline, right, at the beginning, that uh, we have this uh, like a very detailed gen gender identity information there. But for, for sex, uh, yes, there, there are some effects there. And if you check the papers, I remember that, uh, you know, um, some, some results of sex was there, and especially for the depression uh, prediction part. Um, we are actually still on the way to to find an efficient way, you know, to to systematically investigate um, uh, sex effect here because that's actually something I'm very interested in. You know, as we all know that uh, uh, males and females they may not age, uh, you know, in the same way, right? So and there are like a very specific conditions for both males and females as well. So um, yeah, uh, yeah, this this is this is definitely some you know, um, something to do in, in, in next steps. And for, for the racial and ethnic differences, um, I think, uh, I think the CRSA, you know, uh, it, it depends on the population, right? So here in CRSA, we have a dominant uh, population and, uh, and also it's actually very difficult to, to dissociate between the, you know, the racial and also cultural, uh, differences, you know, like uh, you can imagine like, a you know, different ethnicity group groups. They may have a uh, different uh, um, uh, cultural and also lifestyle, even dietary preferences. So um, that um, yeah, we haven't done a systematic way. So we will do that later. But I I need to find a way to first of all, I need to find a way to to present the results, right? So what, rather than just uh, do a massive analysis and a lot of p-values and um, which uh, which is not helpful in my opinion. And second is actually, we also need to be careful before we have anything solid to to say anything, you know, against any, um, you know, cultural ethnicity groups because uh, we certainly don't want to uh, stigmatize uh, certain groups. And uh, as you all may know, these things are really like, complicated you know it's not just a single factor even if you find a single factor just uh, very significant it doesn't mean that 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 is a single contributing factor here for what you see um we got about five minutes left and i think we have about five questions so that's mm -hmm. um so yeah. hba1c was the feature with the largest importance in your analysis did you consider excluding people with diabetes to determine whether the model differs between those with and without yeah, good question. Actually, you know, um, the hemoglobin's uh, H1C, oh, sorry, A1C, it, it's actually increased over age, and uh, uh, it was actually the the most contributing factor there. And uh, but uh, again, you know, diabetes are not majority. It's still like it's a it's a it's a good portion, but not a majority. So I think our bio age still holds. Uh, but uh, things will change, you know, like if, uh, you know, more than half of the, the population, you know, like uh, in certain age uh, having diabetes, then yes, we may need to consider exclude or like uh, perform the analysis, uh, you know, on certain population, you know, to make sure that, uh, um, you know, we are not only uh, being impacted by uh, people uh, with diabetes, you know, that's actually a potential bias, I agree. But for now, the majority of people, luckily or fortunately, you know, they may not have diabetes uh, uh, in that uh, great portion. So I think it's valid to use the current model. Um, yeah, and also even in the general population, you know, the hemoglobin's uh, uh, A1C, they actually increase with age. So it's actually a, a reliable age marker, I would say, you know, even in the non-diabetic uh, people. Um and I'm going to suggest we answer the one about, there's two about biomarkers. Um, mm -hmm. The first one is what data source was your biomarker data of a normal population? And then when looking at 
the biomarker lifestyle associations with age gap, was it this was this a simple linear regression or were there complex dimensionality reduction regression techniques used? Okay. So the biomarker is from the CR CRSA data, right? So it's the, as I mentioned, it's the blood mark, uh, blood uh, test data. And uh, so when, when do, when, so there are two stages, right? First, when we develop the, the, the bio age based on the blood marker, we use the machine learning algorithm, right? To summarize data because it's actually quite complicated. But once we develop this uh, brain, uh, sorry, the bio age gap, you know, based on this uh, brain, uh, the bio age index we develop using machine learning. Once we have that uh, bio age gap, which is the, the predicted age based on the blood marker minus the, the chronological age. Once we have that, we just uh, perform transitional statistics, you know, to see whether there's any association between the, the bio age gap and the uh, uh, certain conditions. Um, and then the, uh, perhaps a, a good question to place to end, which is not an easy question to answer is why is aging often referred to as a state of mind? I think this is, um, probably more of a opinion than uh, based on the research, but any final thoughts mm -hmm. about that for? Yeah, yeah, I mean, we talk about it, sorry for, for some occasional cough, coughing. Um, we talk about this all the time, you know, like that's actually my thought about the, you know, the term, how, how we refer to like successful aging. What do we mean by successful aging? And uh, and my, my opinion, my personal opinion, again, I cannot uh, rep uh, represent anyone else. Uh, my personal opinion is that through all the research based on the CRSA and all, all the other research, uh, you know, in psychiatry, I I have an increasing feeling that yes, biomarkers are really important, but the the subjective uh, state state states is actually also very important. You know, like how you perceive your own health. You know, for for those one who got depression or some other chronic conditions, they may actually you know perceive something. You know, something is wrong. Something is weird in their body even beforehand. So if you combine this information with other like uh, the objective information from the biomarkers, that might be mostly useful. And for successful aging, for example, you know, you, you can have a people maybe, you know, maybe I'm, I'm in a wheelchair, but, uh, you know, but I'm, I'm perfectly happy and I'm so, you know, I, I socialize all the time and I have a good lifestyle. I, I can have like uh, what I I think uh, the successful aging, right? But, the, but the, you cannot say that uh, just because I have this uh, disability, I cannot even achieve successful aging, no matter how hard I try. So there will be like the objective part, but there is also important to consider the subjective part or the perceived part, in my opinion. Okay, great. Well, I think that is a wrap. Um, thank you again for uh, the webinar today and for our attendees for your participation. Lots of questions, which is always good. Um, I'd mm -hmm. like to remind everyone that the next deadline for data access applications for CLSA data is July 10th of 2024. And you can visit the CLSA website under data access to review what data is available, as well as uh, details on the application process. I'd also like to remind everyone to complete your uh, survey upon exiting today so that we can learn from your experiences. Um, our next webinar is called Exploring Relationships Between Social Isolation and Cognitive Change in the CLSA. It will be on May 14th, uh, presented by Shauna, Har Shauna Hopper and John Best from Simon Fraser University in British Columbia. Um, and you can find uh, registration details on the CLSA website under webinars, um, as well as um, I believe it's been posted in the chat box. And finally, uh, if, remember that the CLSA promotes the webinar series using the hashtag CLSA webinar. Um, and we invite you to follow us on uh, Twitter at, at CLSA underscore ELCB. And uh, thank you again, everyone, and enjoy the rest of the day wherever you may be. Thank you.